this, this is a little bit complicated, but yesterday I thing. And so I want to pay for this person, and I have no idea who it was that took that money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I have no hard feelings against them because, I mean, I've done things much worse. In fact, the Lord sent me to me something about the dishonest thing that I've done years and years ago. So what that person needs is conviction from the Lord and forgiveness. What I need from the Lord is forgiveness because I need to make some things right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm going to pray for. Mm -hmm. You say, you, you, so this happened yesterday. Well, that's when I noticed it yesterday morning. So I have no idea. Wow. Okay. We'll pray about that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, we'll definitely pray about that. Wow. Anybody else? Carol? Good. Well, we'll pray about the setup and the ministry and then her safe travels, too. Very good. Okay. Keep praying for me. I'm about six or seven pages short of completing my dissertation. I've been plowing through it. You can see it in my eyes. I'm glossy. I'm, I've needed reading glasses more now than ever before. So uh, I, I just really want to get this thing done because I'm I'm done. I want to I want to do some free study on my own on on different things and not have to worry about all that stuff anymore. You know, it's been very beneficial. It's been in relationship to homiletics training. Um, you know, it's been it's been very good and it's been very theologically sound and um, a lot of a lot of scripture and Ellen White. You know, as a basis for it. But been studying it for four years now. I want to move on to some other things like. Revelation. So, all right. So, anybody else have any prayer requests? Thank God for a safe trip. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Somewhat productive. So. Good. That's always a blessing. Not yet. Yeah. No, but we can mention that. Yeah. I have an unspoken. Just. I want you to remember that, and I'm sure we all have unspoken. We also want to remember our families, our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, etc. Um, you know, time's running out, and Jesus is coming, and we want to be ready. We want to be committed, surrendered, and ready for when Jesus comes. And hopefully, that'll be the message tonight through the seven seals. Although I don't know that we'll get through the whole presentation, we may have to divide it up between tonight and next week because there's a lot of stuff in, in there to, to think about. So, But for the sake of time, why don't we go ahead and go to prayer now. We'll pray. And if you have other requests, of course, you're free to mention them to the Lord in your mind because, you know, God hears and, uh, and uh, He knows what's on your heart and He'll, he'll listen and, and advance His kingdom in, your, in the area of your request. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight we are grateful to have this privilege to be here to reflect on spiritual things. Before we do that, Lord, we want to just be careful to, to mention some of the prayer requests that a few folks have voiced here tonight. Of course, we're thinking of Carol's request. Uh, it's a tough situation. We want to li we lift up the individual who's responsible for um, taking money. Carol's also asked that you work on her heart as well too, Lord. So we pray for that tonight. We would also ask that for ourselves. We pray that you'll continue to work on our own hearts, that we might be right with you, Lord. Carol has mentioned um, Kim as well in the ministry that she's involved in. I believe it's in Texas. I pray that you'll be with that ministry and you'll also watch over her as she's traveling. 
um, that you'll bless her with safety and that you'll bless them with success. Uh, Lord, uh, many people have been affected by the hurricane, Hurricane Florence. We know there are people without power, without food. There's been some fatalities. Many, many, many families and people have been affected by that tragedy, and we just pray that you'll be present, that you'll lend your ear and your arm to those who need you, and that you'll help those who have been affected by this to see your hand through the attitude of folks that will seek to help. So bless them. And as we think about our meeting tonight, Lord, we pray that your Spirit will be here to, to teach us and to guide us. We pray for forgiveness for our sins, and we ask you to bless us and speak to us through what we discuss tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alrighty, so up to this point in time, we have gone through an introduction to the book of Revelation, right? We have talked about Revelation 1 and how that chapter is a specific revelation of Christ. And we have talked about Revelation chapters 2 and 3 on the seven churches. And last week we talked about Revelation chapters 4 and 5 on the heavenly sanctuary. Now tonight we're going to begin a journey into Revelation 6 and 7 and then nibble over into 8 on the seven seals. And I'm going to argue and present, maybe present is a better word than argue, argue can be understood negatively, but I'm going to postulate and present the idea that the seven seals generally follow the chronology of the seven churches in a historical sense, with a few differences, but generally they follow. And so it's going to be very interesting to look at these because we're going to see a lot of similarity, especially in the first four or five seals. Okay, it's going to be interesting. Now, let, let me review a couple of concepts first here. Let me step over here. And, um, we talked about this last week in our discussion of the heavenly sanctuary when Jesus appeared in the throne room, chapter 5, takes the seven-sealed book out of God's hand. We understood and learned that a seal in the Bible signifies a decree that has been basically sanctioned by the king that can't be changed like the laws of the Medes and the Persians, when the kings sealed laws with their signet ring, and they sealed those laws, those laws went into effect, and there was no retracting them. Okay? And in a similar manner, the seals in Revelation, using that biblical understanding, are God's decrees and His revelation and foreknowledge of history in advance, historical trends, based on His sovereignty and also based on human choice in the mix. Because I've told you this before, that redemptive history on planet Earth is a mix between God being sovereign and man having free will. And even though man doesn't always choose God's ways, God is still advancing his purposes, right? Overriding it all for a higher purpose, leading to the great consummation of Christ's return. And the seals, I believe, are a reflection of that. Okay? So... A seal in Scripture signifies the unchangeable decree of a king. And you have Esther's example, and you have Daniel in the lion's den when Darius sealed his fate in the lion's den. Of course, God had other plans, right? And God had other plans in Esther's experience too, right? And overrode that for a higher purpose. Now, if you'll remember last week, we looked at a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy in Manuscript Releases where Ellen White observed that the seven-sealed book was written within, without, on the back side and the front, on the front side, and it basically contained a history since the beginning of time of God's will, God's commandments, historical trends, and all of human history written in this book that God decreed in advance because of his foreknowledge. So Mrs. White even confirms this understanding of a seal, which is powerful. Okay? Now, Again, the seven seals describe God's decrees of historical trends based on his foreknowledge of the choices of individuals and nations. Okay. Isn't it amazing how God can see how human beings will choose? And let's be honest with you, the vast majority of the time, human beings don't choose God's way, especially when it comes to kingdoms and empires through history, many of which have persecuted and enslaved people in advanced selfish purposes. 
But yet God still uses those things to advance a higher purpose. That's powerful to think about. All things work together for good to them that are, love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose, right? So that's what the seven seals describe. And the seven seals, again, generally parallel the very same historical time periods as the seven churches. And we're going to look at that, okay? All right, so let's review the seven churches. Ephesus describes the era of the apostles. And I'll have this on a later slide, but that era was A.D. 31, and Christ ascended to about the year 100, give or take. The era of the original apostles. And then you have the era of Smyrna, which was an era of persecution. And even though there was a persecution, there were persecutions prior to um, this period during the apostolic era, when you usher into the period of Smyrna, starting with 100 AD and spanning through to 313, when Diocletian's decree was reversed by Constantine, ending Christian persecutions, you have a period of persecution. Okay? And you had several Roman emperors that launched vicious persecutions against Christians during that time. Then you have Pergamus, which was an era of compromise. When Constantine enacted his Edict of Toleration and ended Christian persecutions, this began a process of elevating the Christian church to prominence through its spiritual and political marriage with the Roman state. And so the word of God was compromised, Christianity became popular and grew in numbers, and people used it for advancing their own careers and lives, and the sanctity of God's word was lessened during that period and it was compromised. So that's characterized by an era of compromise. And then you have Thyatira, which is an era of apostasy, which describes the Dark Age period. Now, Pergamus went from 313, in my opinion, when Constantine allegedly was converted, to the year 538, when the papacy became the political ruler, or at least an influential political mover and shaker in Western Europe, to the year, um, I'm going to say 1517, as far as Thyatira. So, Pergamus went from 313 to 538, Thyatira went from 538 to about 1517 when the Reformation came to fruition. Okay? Then you have the Sardis Church, which is the era of Reformation, which started off as a spiritually vibrant movement, and then by the end of the Sardis period, it had degenerated into a movement of formalism, and it, had, it basically had a living name, but it was dead. And God encouraged that church, strengthen what remains, because they're ready to die, and I have not found your works perfect before God, basically. And so he encouraged the Sardis church to come back to life. And that spanned from 1517, the Reformation, to about the year 1798, when the papacy was removed from civil power by Napoleon and the French army. Then you have the Philadelphia church, which is a, which is a description of an era of revival, which began with the deadly wound of the papacy in 1798 and extended through to the year 1844. Great period of revival. Because of that deadly wound, the word of God was brought back to life. It was translated in many languages all around the world. There was a spirit of revival and missionary work, and there was also a, a revival in the study of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, which led to the Millerite movement. Okay? And then you finally have Laodicea, which is an era of judgment, which began in 1844 with the opening of the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place. Investigative judgment. Christ went in the most holy, began the judgment, pre-advent judgment, through the second coming. And so this is a general summary of the churches. I think this is reasonable, to be honest with you. Now remember, I also told you when we taught this that these were also literal churches in John's day that had literal problems, and they happened to conveniently parallel eras of church history. Now also, you could have Christians struggle with any one of those seven spiritual dilemmas that they, tr they struggled with in any period of history. Ephesus' problem was they lost their first love. You could have a, a, a person, a Christian living in the Laodicean period who has an Ephesus challenge, right? And you could have a, a person living in the time of Smyrna who is a lukewarm Christian. You know, you could have different Christians with these different challenges living in different eras. Primarily, I'm suggesting that we focus on the historical sequence here because I think that's beneficial for the seven seals, if that makes sense, right? Okay. All right, let me see what we got here. Okay, Let's, let me break down the seals for you just real quick. The first seal is the white horse, and that's described in Revelation 6, 1 and 2. 
Then you have the red horse in Revelation 6, 3, and 4. Then you have the black horse in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. Pale horse, verses 7 and 8. The fifth seal is the souls under the altar, 6, 9, 10, and 11. Then you have the sixth seal, which consists of natural signs. Uh, in verses 12 and 13, you have the day of God's wrath, which is basically the, 140, uh, the uh, second coming of Christ, or at least the events leading up to that right at the end of time. Then you have the 144,000 sealed in Revelation 7, 1 through 8. You have the great multitude in chapter 7, 9 through 17. And I'm going to present a, a, a possible scenario of how to interpret those two groups. And then the seventh seal is silence in heaven for the space of about a half an hour which I think is a powerful detail, and that's in Revelation 8, verse 1. And then in verses 2 and onward of Revelation 8, you find the angel at the altar throwing the, the censer to the earth, and then you find it rolling right into the seven trumpets, which we're going to talk about once we are done with the seven seals. Okay? So we have some interesting and pretty juicy prophetic topics coming up. And, and you know, when it comes to the trumpets, the church has no settled interpretation. But I'm going to present a couple of options I think are, are viable in our understanding of the trumpets. But let's first deal with the seals, okay? So this is a general chronology, right? There's a breakdown. And, and of course, in, in popular culture, the four horsemen are very popular as an apocalyptic subject. You know, you, you see sometimes these movies that attempt to talk about the four horsemen. And, but, but a lot of people, sadly, are actually quite ignorant, maybe unknowledgeable. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's a word. Uh, about what these symbols really point to. And I told you this last week, when you look at the first four horses, each of the four living creatures calls out the horsemen. And how one is like a flying eagle, one is like an ox, one is like a man, and what was the other one? What was the other? I forget what it was. A lion. A lion. And each of those details about the living creatures parallels what that seal represents. It's very interesting. Okay. All right. So let's look at this. Let's look at Revelation 6, 1 and 2. And let's begin with the first seal. All right. Okay. Now, before I do this, let me uh, outline the first, the creatures here. Let me just write these down here so I... There's a powerful insight into this. All right. All right, so, verses 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. Now, we're going to discover that when it says one of the four living creatures, it really means the first one. Because when you see seals 2, 3, and 4, it says the second creature, the third creature, the fourth creature. And when you look at Revelation 5, 4 and 5, it lists them in this order. Okay? So, we're, so it's interesting how this is going to be powerful. Okay? So this first creature says, come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now remember, I've, I've told you before that there are two words for crown in the book of Revelation. One is diadem, diadema, which is an earthly diadem, a crown a king would wear. And then there's stephanos, which is the crown of the overcomer. Guess what crown this is? Stephanos. Which, which implies that this is a positive horse in the sense that white symbolizes purity, a horse is a symbol of strength, this rider had a bow, 
and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So I believe that the white is a symbol of purity, and this, this, is, this parallels the Ephesus period of the apostolic church being spiritually vibrant and successful as it went forth conquering spiritually, sharing the gospel. All right, so let me break this down. White is a symbol of purity and holiness, which is associated with Christ and his followers. The white horse is a symbol of the apostolic church and its success in taking the gospel to the world in that generation. And by the way, who's king of the jungle? And who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? It's Jesus being with this church, helping this church to meet with success. All right. So again, there's a parallel between the creature that announces this first seal, this white horse, and what that horse represents, which is interesting. Okay? All right. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So seal number two, Revelation 6, 3, and 4. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature. All right. There you go. Number two, right? I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Now, what does the color red symbolize? Blood, right? So this, this, yeah, this horse symbolizes destruction and persecution. Now, what, what characterized the Smyrna church? Persecution, persecution right? So this so Smyrna and the red horse parallel each other. And by the way, the, this creature is what? What's a calf? It's a sacrificial animal in the Bible, right? Isn't that interesting? So this describes a period of persecution, much like the Smyrna church, right? So red is a symbol of war and bloodshed. The red horse is a symbol of the warfare and persecution of the church in the post-apostolic era. Christians faced persecution from several Roman emperors, right? So, we can see how this conveniently parallels Smyrna. You're welcome. All right? So, let's look at the third seal now. Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So, I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. <laughs> There's a lot of symbolism there. Okay. Now, the third living creature is a man. And this is a black horse. Okay. So what does is, what is black symbolize? Darkness, Darkness right? And, yeah, and, and persecution, or excuse me, persecution. Pergamos, the third church, was a church that compromised Scripture and allowed spiritual darkness to enter the church, right? So when you look at a summary of this, black is a symbol of spiritual darkness. The black horse is, a, is symbolic of an era of compromise and apostasy where the church aligned itself with the Roman government and compromised her faith. She lost her vital godliness during this period. Now, it mentions what? Barley, right? And wheat. So what do those two things symbolize? Because it looks like, it sounds like, those things are pretty rare to find and, and are going to cost you if you want them, right? So what, are, what do wheat and barley symbolize? Jesus is the bread of life. Right? <clears throat> And wheat are symbolic of the faithful, right? According to the parable of the, of the wheat and the tares, right? So evidently, faithfulness was a rare commodity in that time. But it said, do not hurt the oil and the wine. Oil being a symbol of the Spirit. The wine being a symbol of the blood of Jesus, right? Even though there was darkness in that period, the Spirit was still working and the blood of Jesus was still available to people who wanted to be sincere Christians, right? So those are some possible gleanings from these details. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So let's look at number four now. Oop, before I do that, this dark era of church compromise began with the conversion of Constantine the Great in AD 312, 313. And notice it says right here, Constantine, by this sign, conquer. 
he allegedly had this vision of, by the Christian sign, go ahead and conquer your enemies. And he attributed that to Christ, and he had a nominal conversion. All right? So, but let's look at a couple things that Constantine did during this era of spiritual darkness. Constantine was allegedly converted to Christ during his famous battery at, victory at the Milvian Bridge in AD 312. You see, Diocletian was the last sole Roman emperor who came to power in 284 AD. And he ruled until 303 when he abdicated the throne. And the Roman Empire at that time faced two huge challenges. One was the challenge of keeping its borders secure. And the other was the challenge of succession. If an emperor would have died or abdicate, it was a long process to find a replacement. So Diocletian came up with a, a, a solution called the Tetrarchy. And what he did was he divided the Roman Empire into, in, into halves, east and west, and then each half would have an Augustus and a Caesar. The Augustus would be the emperor, the Caesar would be the vice emperor. Each one would have its own court, its own capital, its own army. And that way, if borders were threatened in those regions, they could get there quickly with their army to, 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 to secure the border militarily. All right? And then, if the Augustus were to die or abdicate, the Caesar would move up to be the Augustus, and then that Augustus would appoint another Caesar to take his place as vice emperor. So you resolve those two issues. Now, Constantine, came, Constantine was born and came into this world at a time when his father was a famous general in Gaul, and in Britain, and he grew up in the army camp. He was very familiar with Roman political life, and when his father died, his troops declared him as emperor. And there was another rival emperor in, in the West, Maxentius, who also declared for the throne, and Constantine met Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge, and, and Maxentius' army was routed decisively by Constantine's army. In fact, most of his army drowned in the Tiber River as they retreated over a bridge at the Milvian Bridge, and a lot of them were drowned, and, and Constantine emerged victorious. And then he eventually temporarily ended the Tetrarchy and took over the whole empire for a while. And then after his death, his three sons fought over control, and then eventually the Tetrarchy settled back down into a, a regular operation to where Eastern, Eastern and Western empires consolidated and then eventually the Eastern Empire went its own direction when the church at Constantinople broke with the Roman church. So it's very interesting history. But Constantine won this victory, okay? And with the Eastern Emperor Licinius Galerius, Constantine enacted the famous Edict of Milan, which again granted religious liberty to every citizen in the Roman Empire, <coughs> thus ending the era of Christianity persecution against Christians. So this is a monumental event in history, my friends. This is the first ever religious liberty decree in Western European history, granting religious freedom. Okay? That later would be overturned in several ways, but interesting event. Okay? Constantine favored Christians and clergy in government and society. He would give positions to Christians. He would give clergy tax breaks. He would grant churches nonprofit status. <laughs> the Roman version of that. And basically what that boils down to is you don't pay taxes. Okay? Um, so he granted a lot of favors. He gave high government positions to people that aligned with him. So Christianity triumphed in the Roman Empire. It became the state religion of the empire and church and state united. All right? And many pagan practices were brought into the Christian faith during this dark spiritual period. And so this is why that black horse parallels Pergamos, the church of compromise, in being a time of spiritual compromise. Okay? And it's interesting that this third creature that, that talks about this seal is a man. And that, that could be symbolic of the human traditions, the man-made traditions that found their way into the church during this period. So I think it's interesting, I mean, it's just my little gleaning on this, but I think it's interesting how each creature, its qualities kind of parallel these seals, right? Have I lost you? You guys are looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, interesting. All right, so let's look at the fourth seal, verses 7 and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see, and this creature is a flying eagle, right? Now, you know where I'm going with this, right? This is very interesting, because when you look at the woman in Revelation 12, she flies into the wilderness during the dark ages, 
And she was given two wings of a great eagle where she was nourished by God for a time, times and half a time. So we, we can catch a little glimpse of the dark ages here. Okay, but it says, Fourth living creature said, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was Death and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Okay. So what does this mean? What is, what is, what is pale? What's the color pale signify? Sickness. Sickness and death, basically, right? When you're pale, you're sick, you're dying, right? So this is descriptive of a spiritually dead church, right? And remember, Thyatira... The fourth church was the Dark Age church, right? During the Dark Ages. And that church parallels this pale horse, okay? So, pale is the color of death. This fourth horse describes the spiritually dead experience of the medieval church. This era began with the rise of the Bishop of Rome as a political power and extended to the Reformation. And notice, what is it? Death and Hades rode this horse. And they were given power over the earth to kill one-fourth, one-quarter, with the sword and with famine and with the beasts of the earth. Now, what's that mean? What do you think that means? Is that yes, I think so. And beasts, you know, some have suggested these are literal animals that devour people and maybe hurt people. I, think, I tend to think more prophetically that beasts equal kingdoms and how the Roman church used various kingdoms to control conscience. Remember, Rome didn't have an army of her own. She used the armies of governments under her control, right? And through those governments, using the sword and, and famine, you couldn't get the basic necessities of survival unless you complied with the church's wishes, right? There are a lot of different things going on to keep people under the thumb of the church during that time. And people were not only spiritually dead, as described by the pale color, but there was also a lot of death and martyrdom during that period, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And again, we see this flying eagle concept when you go to Revelation 12. You see the woman going into the wilderness during the Dark Ages where she's fed. She's given wings like an eagle, right? To fly into the wilderness. So we see some parallels there, I think, with this. Does that make sense? Can you buy into that? Does that sound plausible without being dogmatic? Right? Any questions or comments, thoughts? Okay, very good. All right, let me talk some more about this pale horse. The medieval Roman church was steeped in tradition, rites, and formalism. It had no sense of mission except to silence alleged heretics. Right? There were, however, faithful Christians in this area, era. Many of them were forced to flee into the remote areas to maintain purity of faith. The Waldensians were one such faithful group. And there were others too. Right? But the Waldensians it seemed like the kind of like a symbol of a woman to me, because they were in the wilderness and all the stuff that they had to go through with Rome and the, you know what the rocks mm -hmm. and the leaves and all those things protected them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They 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 spent time in the mountains of the Piedmont, you know. And uh, you read the Great Controversy, I mean Mrs. White talks about their history and how that, there were even times when they went to war with papal armies to defend themselves, you know, which brings in the whole question of bearing arms, you know, uh, which we won't get into tonight, please. <laughs> but um, but the Waldensians were maybe they felt like the truth would have been wiped yeah. out if they had been totally destroyed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they had to keep the torch of truth alive, you know. And God is—it's like the seven candlesticks symbolize the seven churches, and they're always lit. There's always at least one candlestick stick lit in the sanctuary. And God always has His truth alive in every generation, basically, is what that symbolizes. So the Waldens, Waldensians were God's vehicles of keeping the truth alive. And in fact, they kept the Sabbath for over a thousand years. And it was only recently, in the last two or three hundred years, I think, that they gave up the Sabbath. Because there's a Waldensian group over in... Yeah, just in, uh, between Hickory. It's in, it's in Valdez, which... Is, the, is a derivative of the word Waldensian, but it's in between um, Hickory and Morganton. Um, but, uh, but they gave up the Sabbath, unfortunately. But they kept it alive for a long time, though, and kept that teaching alive to pass on. 
Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that there's a group out there that would dare not be under our control. God forbid that someone else have control of their own conscience. Right? So, Steve. I've uh, read some 18th and 19th century writers. I don't know whether they're exaggerating or not. But a lot of them claim that uh, there were 50 million people that were killed oh, yeah. in the papal Roman uh, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John Dowling wrote a book called The History of Romanism. And he said that there's been an average of 40,000 murders every year every year that the pope that, that popery has existed. And there was another one, William Edward Hartpole Lecky, who was a who was a 19th century historian wrote in a book called The Rise of the Spirit of Nationalism in Europe. He wrote that the Church of Rome had has shed more innocent blood than any institution in history will be questioned by no Protestant who has an accurate knowledge of history. It's the most devastating institution that has ever existed on the face of this planet, in my opinion. And I, and I don't mean to judge Catholics. I don't judge Catholic Christians. I'm just saying the institution put a lot of people to death through the years. And that's why in Daniel 7... The judgment in heaven primarily relates to the judgment of the little horn. Because the little horn is a professed Christian power and God has to conduct a judgment to expose that power to heavenly realms for what it really is. It's not a Christian power despite its profession. Look what it's done. You know, so. Dick, please. I, I think it's, to me it's remarkable that people like the Waldensians do that during that period were able to keep their faith. It was not written down. They didn't have a Bible. It, it, it came by word of mouth all the way, I guess maybe all the way from the mm -hmm. Apostle, mm -hmm. Apostolic era. Uh, but if they did have Bibles, they were few and far between. Yeah, but they weren't they weren't readily accessible though, I don't think. The Bible yeah. was not readily accessible. They may they might have had a couple pages when they went into deal in the villages and sell their wares and stuff and can we trust this person here's a copy here's a page from john's gospel you know they might have had a page or two to give but yeah i mean but the point is is that it wasn't it's not like they had a bunch of bibles laying around that's right you know yeah god in his providence exactly yeah one of the most powerful things that Mrs. White said about the Waldensian children is their discretion with their words. Because one wrong word uttered at the wrong time could cause the death of thousands. So they, they, they taught their children, mums the word, unless the Spirit of God directly compels you to say something. That's powerful, because I, I tell my kids all the time, would you guys watch, close your mouths, you're running, you're, my ears are getting tired of listening to you talk. You know, and oh, that children today would learn that. And I'm talking about my own children, and I'm talking about myself because I wasn't taught that either. You know, so yeah, I know, I know. Yes, Joe, please. Uh, Robert just uh, said what I was going to say with our social media. Yes. Uh, the president's gotten in trouble once or twice <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and that's why social media is. You know, I. This is, I'll give you a sanctified gripe. I think people bear too much on public forums like that. I think that's why on my Facebook page I, I post a couple pictures of what I'm doing, maybe say a few words, and, and maybe put baptisms on there and things like that. But I try never to get into politics or religion because I've got you know a lot of friends in Maine where I grew up. They're not even Christians, and they're friends with me, and I just want them to get a good you know impression of our faith. And, um, but sometimes I think, you know, my fellow, my fellow brethren and sisters sometimes kind of spoil it for me by what they, what they let come out of their mouths. And listen, we're not all, per I mean, I, I've misspoken at times, so it's not like I'm guilt-free. But I, I do think with social media, we have to be very careful what we put out there, because it's public. Once it's out there, I mean, you might remove a post, but that still doesn't necessarily stop the influence it, it has, and it ripples through people's lives. So we just have to be careful, I think, with that. Yeah. Susie. Ezekiel uh, five seventeen goes along with this. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, Ezekiel talks about those four creatures a lot. Uh, and, and, um, can I? Yeah, say it. Okay. <clears throat> 
So I will sin against you, Phantom, and wild beasts, and they will berate, berate you. Pestilence and blood shall pass through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And verse 12 said, One third of you shall die of the pestilence and be consumed with phantom in your midst, and one third of you, one third shall fall by the sword all around you, and I will scatter another third of to all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds to me like they're. Ezekiel's combining the seals and trumpets together on that because the trumpets talk a lot about one-third mm -hmm. destruction. And that's why I believe that's one detail as to why the trumpets and the plagues are not the same in Revelation. They're different, even though there's some similarities. But we'll talk more about that. All right, so let's go to the next seal here. Let's look at Revelation 6, 9, 10, and 11. Here's where we shift directions a little bit, although... This fifth seal, still, par seal uh, still parallels the fifth church. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then white, a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Okay, so this brings into question the state of the dead, um, which can be explained, but here we see souls under the altar in the heavenly sanctuary. And this is, of course, symbolic. It's not literal. Okay? But notice here, you find these, these martyrs, right? And you find God telling them, listen, you're going to rest a little while longer until your number is made up, basically, because there's more people that have to be put to death for the gospel. Right? So what does this symbolize? Well, souls under the altar. Are these literal souls under the golden altar in heaven, or is this to be understood in a symbolic fashion? Well, Revelation is fraught with symbolism, so I've, I'm going to assume and presume that this is symbolic, it's not necessarily literal. Otherwise, how many souls have been martyred through the years? Could they all fit under the altar in heaven? I mean, how big is the golden altar in the heavenly sanctuary? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> the point is, is that it's, it wouldn't make sense to take it literally. Well, it depends on what you, uh, what you define as a soul. <laughs> Well, the scriptural definition of the soul is a living being. Yeah, it's mind and body combined. Exactly. Not part of the breath of God and mm -hmm. body combined. Mm -hmm. It's a soul. Exactly. So it would have to be piled up. Pretty high, right? <laughs> and, here, and building on that, here's another thing to think about. You know in the sanctuary service, during the daily service, when the sin offering was given, the priest would take the blood into the holy place, and he would sprinkle the blood on the four horns of the golden altar. And according to Jeremiah 17.1, that symbolized a written record of sin. And in symbol, in the gold, on the golden altar, all those sins piled up. And on the Day of Atonement, after the high priest sprinkled blood on the eastern side of the Ark of the Covenant, his next step was to go back into the holy place and cleanse the golden altar on the Day of Atonement, which symbolized a cleansing of the record of sin. Now, thinking about that principle here, could these souls under the altar that are crying out be symbolic of how there's a record at the golden altar with all the names of these martyrs and how their blood, like Abel's blood. Remember what God said to Cain? Your brother's, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. And these souls under the altar are crying. So could this be the written record of the martyrdom of these people that are, that are crying out to God in, in a symbolic sense, saying, God, avenge us. But God is saying, look, wait a little while longer. I'm going to give you a white robe. You're saved, right? But there's still some more martyrs that have to make up the number. And we're told from the spirit of prophecy that the martyrs will have a special border on their garment in heaven, a red border, symbolizing that they gave up their lives for the sake of the gospel. So evidently, God's got a number to make up in terms of martyrs, which is kind of interesting, right? And if they were really in heaven, they would yeah, and they wouldn't be sitting there going to avenge us because that's not the, necessarily the spirit of heaven. Heaven would be, you know, I mean, 
Maybe they would be crying out for vengeance, I don't know, but I don't, I, it just doesn't seem like the, the, the spirit of those that actuate heavenly beings. And they wouldn't have to be sleeping. Right. Exactly. Well, but Mark, they're in heavenly rest. That's what, that's what people have said to me. But I agree with you. I think you're right. Okay, so, there is a literal heavenly sanctuary with literal furniture. Okay, Revelation 11, 19 and many other texts. There's a golden altar in the heavenly sanctuary. We've seen that in Revelation 8, 3 and 9, 13. There's actually a golden altar with incense being ministered on it. So an, al an altar can be a symbol of sacrifice where shed blood is applied in place too. Right? So, souls are living beings. There you go, Dick, right? I mean, what's a, how do we define a soul? It's a living, breathing being, right? Souls are not immortal, so these can't be like immortal souls floating around under the altar, right? Or packed in like sardines under the altar. This seal is descriptive of Christian martyrs that gave up their lives for the gospel during the Reformation, right? During the Dark Ages. This fifth seal corresponds to the Sardis Church and describes an era of Reformation which extended from 1517 to 1798, the year when the medieval church lost its power. Because when the Protestant Reformation broke, martyrdom increased substantially because the papacy sought to attack those that were breaking away from the church and embracing the Protestant faith. So these souls under the altar symbolize this fifth church of Sardis, which is the Reformation church, of which was attacked and persecuted by the papacy. And some Christians who were reformers were martyred for their faith. Does that make sense? I think, it's, I think it sounds pretty solid. All right? So these souls are not literally under the altar. There is a written record of their lives at the golden altar. And again, Genesis 4.10, God said to Cain, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Right? So it's the blood. It's, it's, it's these lives of the martyrs that are crying out to God because they've died for the sake of the gospel. And of course, David said in Psalm 56, verse 8, Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not all in thy book? You know, so the tears of God's people are recorded in the written record of heaven, which I believe is at the golden altar my personal opinion. Okay? So it's interesting. All right, so let's look at the sixth seal now. We're getting to the sixth seal toward the end of chapter six. We've got about, what, 10 or 12 minutes left here. Okay, so verses 12 and 13. And here's where we kind of shift from the seven churches a little bit in terms of chronology. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Okay, so what does this symbolize? If the, if the Sardis church ends around the turn of the 18th century in 1798, then evidently these, what we might call natural signs, physical signs, right, must have transpired around that time, right, and forward, right, okay, so we see a great earthquake, we see the moon turning red as blood, and we see falling stars, right, and most of us know Adventist church history and have read the great controversy, right, and we know what our pioneers taught about this, and I think there's some validity to that, the natural signs of the sixth seal, the great earthquake, famous Lisbon, Portugal earthquake that took place on November 1st, 1755, Okay. It is one of the most deadly quakes in history. It's estimated that it was an 8.5 to 9.0 on the Richter scale, between 10,000 and 100,000 people killed. Right? Its shocks and tsunamis were felt in Europe, Africa, and South America. I mean, it, was, it just was felt all around the world, basically, in, in a lot of different places. Its study and analysis led to the development of modern seismology and earthquake engineering, which is interesting. Okay. Then we have the dark day. The moon became darkened, right? One such day, and the sun became darkened, rather. One such day took place in May of, on May 19th of 1780, which was felt in the New England states and in Canada. It lasted from noon to the middle of the next <coughs> evening. A blood-red moon appeared after the darkness lifted. Okay? And then you have the falling stars, which basically took place on November 13th, 1833 which was the Leonid meteoric shower. This was one of the most spectacular displays of meteoric activity in history. It extended from 2 a.m. until daylight. 
And so our pioneers, as they studied and, and saw the nearness of the end of the 2300-year prophecy in 1844, they attributed these natural signs to be a fulfillment of prophecy based on Revelation 6. Okay? And now I'm going to argue, however, that these signs were just the beginning. I think there are going to be more of these things repeating themselves. Obviously, we've seen earthquakes. We've seen meteor showers. I don't know that we've seen a blood-red moon since then, or the sun being dark. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we, we saw an eclipse, I think, what was it, a year ago last August, right? But it wasn't that, didn't last like this, you know. Um, it just was for a short time when the, when the moon passed between us and the sun. Um, but, but I... But, Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was just this is supernatural. Yeah. So, but I think some of these things are going to repeat themselves. Personally, I think there's. I mean, we've seen earthquakes. Jesus even said that earthquakes are going to be in diverse places, and they're going to increase with frequency and with intensity, in terms of devastation. I know the you know, big one, right? Yeah. 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 These fault lines are on Mother Earth. The seams of Mother Earth are falling apart, you know, because of sin and because of time is advancing, right? So these natural signs are important. The Great Lisbon Earthquake in 1755, the Dark Day in 1780, and the Falling Stars in 1833 all help to show that we have moved into the final era of Earth's history. These types of natural signs will repeat themselves and become more frequent as Christ's return draws near, okay? All right, so now let's jump down to Revelation 6. Well, we, 14 through 17. We've got to do the end of 6 first. Um, then, after these natural signs, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the commanders, and the mighty men, and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So, I personally believe that this text describes the second coming of Christ, and, and of course the events, the plagues, and the, and the final destruction leading right up at the very end of time to the second coming of Christ. Because you, saw, you, you see all these people running to hide from Christ, right? They can't face Him. And you see mountains and islands moved out of their places. And all these different people who are not saved running. And they ask a very important question, which is... Yeah. And I believe Revelation 7 answers that question. It's very interesting that right after this question is asked, you find a mention of the 144,000 and a mention of the great multitude. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But let's talk about this text, which describes, I believe, the second coming. And I think the uh, seventh seal kind of recapitulates that a little bit, too. But um, this text discusses the return of Christ with power and glory. Christ returns with such power and glory that mountains and islands will be moved out of their places. Right? Christ's return can also be referred to as the great day of God's wrath. This text ends with a question, who will stand in that great day? Revelation 7 answers that question. Who is going to stand? All right, now it's five minutes to eight. Do you really want to get into this now? Um, well, maybe next week we'll get into... Yeah, chapter 7. I hate to leave you with a cliffhanger, but that's kind of good because then you'll come back. <laughs> And then you'll tell your friends, come on, he's going to be talking about the 144,000. We're going to see if he's a heretic or if he's solid. <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got some ideas on it. And I, I think there are two or three common positions among Seventh-day Adventists on the identity of the 144,000. I've got... I, I embrace one of those three positions and I have spirit of prophecy, I think, to back it up. But... You know, Mrs. White does say, don't get into controversy over the issue. Just strive to be among them. Strive to emulate their experience, right? And she also says, those who are a part of that group will also know without question when the time, when the time comes. 
So if you're on the earth and you're being persecuted by the beast and you haven't received the mark and you're, you're seeing plagues fall around, around the earth, there's a good chance that you'll, you might be part of that number, but you won't brag about it because it's going to be a devastating time. It's going to be a very sad time because the vast majority of people on earth have, have rejected God's love and the salvation that Christ offers. And it'll be a, be a devastating time. It won't be a fun time. But, you know, after the cloud comes the sunshine when Jesus comes. All right, any thoughts? What do you think so far? Do you think these, the, the view of the seals here is pretty... you think it's consistent? Does it sound plausible? Okay, good. It's interesting to me that we've been between verses 13 and 14 for 185 years. Yes, basically. Yeah, and that's true. Is it possible that the sixth seal includes a little bit more than the actual coming of Christ? Maybe to include close of probation. Sure. Yeah. I think it does. I think it it you know certainly embraces the proclamation of the seventh of, of the second coming. So it could you know the, the, the falling of the stars was in eighteen thirty three, shortly after that was eighteen forty four and the rise of the remnant church that proclaims the second advent. So it's very possible that it could embrace that era, I think, of the proclamation of Christ's return. Because that's what the text describes, you know. And the plagues falling symbolizes the end of his ministry, intercessory ministry, which could also allude to the heavenly sanctuary judgment, and which began in 1844. So yeah, I think, I think it's very possible. Yeah. Any other thoughts? You all are very quiet tonight. Not very many comments. What happened? Don't study the seven seals often, do we? So maybe, maybe there's been a, a moment, you know, some moments of reflection tonight because we're learning and understanding, right? And I'm, and I'm not saying that I'm infallible in my positions, but I think they make sense. You know, the white horse in Ephesus, the red horse in Smyrna, the black horse in Pergamos, the pale horse in Thyatira, souls under the altar in Sardis. Then you start to shift a little bit because the uh, dark day and the um, falling stars and, and the... Uh, Earthquake and all that happened under Thyatira, Sardis, or well, actually just Sardis and into Philadelphia, and even you know transitioning into Laodicea with the uh, seventh seal. So, you know, there's some overlap there in these last few churches and last couple seals. But I think it's neat how it parallels, and I really think it's neat how each creature who announces it, these first four seals has qualities that can relate kind of in parallel with what that seal represents. Right? Which, is, which I think is interesting. So not only do these four creatures represent some phase in the ministry of Christ, Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He was the sacrifice for sin. He took humanity as a human being. And guess what? In Revelation 6, He was, he was given wings to fly up to God into His throne after His resurrection where Satan couldn't hurt Him. And He also is the, the, the preserver and, and watcher over His church when it's in hiding. So it's interesting how these four living angelic beings each have a quality about them that represents some aspect in the ministry of Christ, and yet they also parallel these first four seals too in terms of you know, the first church being a conquering church like a lion, and the second church being a persecuted church like a sacrificial calf, and the third church being a spiritually dark church because it embraces traditions of men and not the Word of God, and then the flying eagle, the pale horse, how it symbolizes Christians who fly into the wilderness to be preserved by God. So there's a lot of different layers to this, isn't there, that we can look at. And again, we're just discussing food for thought. But I think the historical understanding of the seven seals is where we're safest, if that makes sense. So, All right, so it's 8 o'clock. Any final thoughts before we wrap this thing up tonight? What did you think? Was it, did it make sense? Good, okay. Well, next week's going to be interesting. The 144,000 and the great multitude, who are they? Are they the same group? Are they different groups? Are they literal? Are they symbolic? What do they symbolize? Next week, we'll see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you for predicting and projecting history centuries in advance for us. 
And Lord, we, we thank you for our discussion tonight and for what we've learned. And Lord, we pray that that would continue. And we would ask you, Lord, as we continue to study, that you would bless us with light and understanding and that you would deepen our, our Christian walk with you as we continue to study. Lord, we also want to ask that you'll watch over us as we head home tonight. We pray that you'll watch over us and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen.